Good day, folks, and welcome back to the channel. It's a shekel of tire, like from the Bible. I mean, basically what you have is a really cool coin that is collectible because it's, you know, from Jerusalem, it's from the time of Christ. Supposedly, Judas received 30 pieces of silver to uh, basically drop a dime on Jesus. It was probably a coin like this. So there is a possibility this could be one of those coins, is that correct? No. <laughs> the odds are highly against it. They made yeah. millions of them. Sure. Okay. okay. Um, now, the big question is, how much do you want for it? $2,000. What do you think, chum? It's old. Will you take 14? How about 1750? 1500? I could do 16. Yeah, 1600. Deal. Okay. Hey guys, I got some uh, potentially bad news. An out of town detective has called Las Vegas police. The shekel that you recently brought in, there's a chance it might be stolen. They want to put it on hold. Well, that's 1600 bucks down the toilet. So what's up? The coin we've been working with the police on. Turns out that the guy who originally owned it got compensated for his loss. It's ours. They released it this morning. So it's not stolen. That's the bullet there. Here are times when Rick Harrison almost found himself behind bars. Guy in a suit comes in the pawn shop, got a big set of diamond earrings. Ask him all the questions, he even had a receipt. I gave him $40,000. Three days later, the police took him from me. That was the biggest bust I ever had in the pawn shop. 1973 Penn State Orange Bowl ring. Rick's appetite for fast selling and highly profitable sports memorabilia does not blind him when a client offers a 1973 Penn State Orange Bowl ring. When the seller's story of how he came to own the ring does not quite add up, Rick smells a rat. I've got a Penn State University 1973 Orange Bowl ring. Okay. I think it's worth at least 1500 okay. Where'd you get this? I went to Penn State and guy down the hall played on the team and uh, he needed some money and I bought it back then. It was a big year for Penn State because they had the undefeated season. Even after the seller shows Rick the player's name and number on the ring to back up the suspicious story that he got from his college roommate at Penn State, Rick is not convinced. A close inspection of the ring reveals that its engravings have been filed off. Not only is this a classic sign of stolen jewelry, it makes it impossible to prove who the ring originally belonged to. Penn State has a huge football tradition, and with such a big following, there's people that collect anything Penn State. On the one side has a player's name and his number and their record, which was 12-0, and and it has a score from the Orange Bowl. Mind if I take a closer look? Sure. This is the way you got it? Yeah, that's the way I got it. I got a problem with this ring. What's that? The engraving's been removed on it. The engraving makes it 100% identifiable. You take the engraving out, there's no identifying it. It's illegal for me to buy or sell anything when any identifying mark has been removed on an item. Serial numbers, engravings, anything like that. The seller hopes to get $1,500 for the ring and tries convincing Rick to overlook the likely criminal irregularity. Unfortunately for the seller, Rick is not willing to risk arrest by profiting off an item whose identifying marks have been tampered with. It's like buying a car without a VIN number. I could see with a wedding ring, but I mean, here it's Penn State University, it's 1973. I know that, but you have to look at it from my position, okay? I can't take it. Okay. All right, dude. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't do nothing with it. Okay. Stolen Submarine. Rick rarely lets his lust for profit get the better of him. Unfortunately, he was not so discerning when Lynette offered him a submarine. The potential profit puts such giant dollar signs in Rick's eyes that he misses a huge red flag in the story of how Lynette came to acquire the sub. She allegedly got it free of charge from a person who simply wanted to declutter his backyard. He's more concerned about the sub's horrible condition. So what do we have here? A one-man submarine. Where in the world did you get this? I got it from somebody that told me to take it off their yard. They didn't want it. So this was just sitting in someone's yard and says you could have it if you wanted. Right. So yeah, that doesn't look very comfortable. This sub is in rough condition and missing a lot of parts. Call me crazy, but I'm still interested. After complaining that the submarine is inoperable and missing a lot of parts, he makes it clear to Lynette that he will only purchase it at a throwaway price. If only Rick knew that he would be throwing away any money he gave the conniving woman, he may have made a different decision. Though Lynette starts off with a lofty $25,000 asking price, Rick still remains unsuspicious when Lynette quickly accepts $3,000. The amazing thing is someone gave this to you because I imagine these things are over $100,000 new. At least. How much did you want for it? Twenty-five dollars This is my problem. I have no idea what it would cost to fix this thing up. You know, I would offer you a few thousand dollars and I don't think you're going to take that. I'll give you two grand for it. Can I do that? I'll go three grand, that'd be it. 
All right, got a deal. Okay. Don't you tell the old man anything about this. My lips are sealed. Corey and the old man are not only pleased to learn that Rick made such a stupid purchase against company policy, Rick manages to convince them that the sub is worth at least $10,000 in parts. Tom Lee, I saw Rick give a lady a lot of money a while ago. What was it for? And I'm looking at the computer and you see he bought a submarine. That was a stupid buy. One man submarines, the first one used in battle was used by the American colonies against the British. Quest is an Australian filming company. They bought this sub to try to use it for filming. But the problem with this design is very uncomfortable. It's missing its upper viewing dome and a lot of the parts that originally made it function. It's pretty beat up. You're probably looking at $100,000 to fix it up. Is it worth anything? The value of the sub as it sits is $10,000. I want an apology. However, the next twist in the tragic deal has Corey and the old man livid. After a viewer recognizes the submarine on TV as one stolen from his client, Rick has no option but to return it to its real owner, who, as it turns out, did not give it out free of charge. Rick was lucky to avoid arrest after making such an obviously dumb deal. Parade Cannon Rick is always up to buy anything that goes boom. When Robert offers him a pristine post-Civil War parade cannon for $60,000, Rick is beyond tempted. He knows that collectors will line up around the block for the breech loading cannon used by GAR to celebrate soldiers who succumbed to the Civil War. So what do we got here? It's an antique parade or saluting cannon. I'd like to shoot a potato out of it. <laughs> I called the guys at the pawn shop today to come down and see my antique parade cannon. This cannon, I actually keep it in my house, but it is a little bit on the large side. I've done a lot of research, and I'm pretty sure it's worth $60,000. Can you tell me anything about it? This is obviously a breech-loading cannon. You insert a cartridge in it that's preloaded with powder, and it was used by the Civil War soldiers after the war at a GAR post. This was their cannon that they used in memorial parades to salute the Civil War soldiers, and it produces a very nice, substantial report. Did they have any paperwork or anything else with it when you bought it? Not really, to tell you the truth. This is an amazing old cannon. You rarely see one of these in private hands, and collectors go crazy for them. But I hate that he's got no paperwork for it. You have to be really careful about stuff like this. Let me call up a buddy of mine. Let me get him down here, have him take a look at it. If everything's legit, maybe we can do something. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Luckily for Rick, he narrowly escaped buying an illegal item by calling Sean, an arms expert, to inspect the cannon. Hey, Sean, what's going, going on, buddy? Today, Rick called me out to the middle of nowhere, and this thing better be worth it because this was a long drive. Holy <laughs> Check out this badass cannon. I really want to hear this thing go boom. Let's burn some powder. Let's, let's go. load this thing up. Guys, make sure your earpieces are in, and it wouldn't even hurt to put your hands over your ears on top of that when this thing goes. All right, you guys, need to get back. OK. One. Fire! That boom knocked my glasses off my head. <laughs> I felt a shockwave hit me. Though the cannon is in excellent shape and fires perfectly, Sean has some heartbreaking news. Since the cannon was manufactured in 1903, it is illegal to own. Had Rick bought the cannon without filing exhausting paperwork with the ATF, he could have easily ended up under arrest. I need to look at certain aspects of this to determine, hopefully, when that barrel was made. Down at the bottom, it looks like S-E-P-T for the abbreviation of September. I see a curl down here of a three, and it's actually 1903. I can't buy any guns made after 1898, so this looks like a total bust. The overall form of this might be 1890s. This is where it becomes a real gray area yeah. when it comes to the law, that this is OK in Nevada. All right, so it's something I would definitely love to buy. But until I know everything for sure, I, I can't even make an offer. OK. Stolen diamond earrings. Rick is not above falling for the oldest tricks in the con man's book, judging a book by its cover. How else would he have gotten scammed into buying a pair of stolen diamond earrings for $40,000? Had Rick's guard not been lowered by the seller's fancy suit, he would never have considered making the deal. After inspecting the diamond earrings and the fake sale receipt, Rick cannot believe his luck when he snags the fancy earrings for a mere $40,000. Guy in a suit comes in the pawn shop, got a 
big set of diamond earrings. Asked him all the questions, he even had a receipt. Only when the police came knocking on his door did Rick regret the purchase. He was shocked to learn that the earrings were stolen and nearly wept when the police repossessed the pair and returned it to its rightful owner. Even after the thief was arrested, Rick was inconsolable because unlike the earrings, the $40,000 he paid vanished without a trace. He gave him $40,000. Three days later, the police took him from me. That was the biggest bust I ever had in the pawn shop. Shekel of Tire Rick is way nerdier than he lets on. He cannot stop himself from drooling when presented with an opportunity to purchase a rare shekel of tire. After he lectures Chum and the client on the significance of the coin, which is the exact type Judas received after betraying Jesus Christ, he quickly moves on to business. What do you got here? It's a shekel of tire, like from the Bible. I mean, basically what you have is a really cool coin that is collectible because it's, you know, from Jerusalem, it's from the time of Christ. Supposedly, Judas received 30 pieces of silver to uh, basically drop a dime on Jesus. It was probably a coin like this. So there is a possibility this could be one of those coins, is that correct? No. <laughs> the odds are highly against it. They made millions of them. Sure. Okay. okay. Um, but just, there's still a possibility. It's however minute, okay? The shekel of Tyre was a really common coin a couple thousand years ago in the Middle East, but there aren't many left. And even though we can't prove that this is one of the infamous 30 pieces of silver from the Bible, it is still valuable due to its rarity. The client is undeterred by Rick's complaints that the coin has been cleaned, which means that it's lost much of its intrinsic value and desirability to collectors. He asked for $2,000 for the biblical coin. Rick counters with $1,000 and is quite pleased with himself when the seller eventually accepts $1,600 for the historical coin. Now the big question is how much do you want for it? $2,000. What do you think, chum? It's old. Will you take 14? How about 1750? 1500? I could do 16. Yeah, 1600. Deal. Okay. All right, you want to go write them up? Later on, Andy, a security officer at the pawn shop, approaches Rick with some terrible news. The police have informed him that the coin was reportedly stolen. Luckily for Rick, not only did he not get into any trouble with the police, he got to keep the coin because the owner's insurance had already compensated the loss. Hey guys, I got some uh, potentially bad news. An out-of-town detective has called Las Vegas police. The shekel that you recently brought in, there's a chance it might be stolen. They want to put it on hold. Well, that's 1600 bucks down the toilet. <sighs> so what's up? The coin we've been working with the police on, Turns out that the guy who originally owned it got compensated for his loss. It's ours. They released it this morning. So it's not stolen. There's the bullet there. Luckily for us, the coin was insured and the insurance company paid for the loss. So that makes the coin free and clear. Tortoise shell guitar. Weird items are offered to Rick on a daily basis. So he's not shocked when John offers him a tortoise shell guitar. He only gets suspicious when John asks Rick if the quirky guitar is legal to sell. For once, Rick doesn't seem to know it all. After admiring the beautiful hues of brown on the guitar and wondering how it was made, Rick decides to call an expert. I have this guitar here and I wasn't sure whether or not I could legally sell it. Yeah, I've never had anyone ask me if it's legal to sell their guitar and that would explain why. It's a tortoise shell. Okay. <laughs> Tortoise shell was real popular back in the day for making combs, sunglasses, guitar picks, all sorts of stuff. It looks cool and it's incredibly durable, but some tortoises became endangered. So in the early 70s, the trade in tortoise shell was banned. I mean, it really is beautiful. I have a friend with a store right down the street, so he might know the laws on it. That sounds good. Okay, let me give him a call. Jesse Amoroso, the guitar expert, sheds light on the rarity and popularity of the unique guitars. After tempting Rick and John with the revelation that the guitars are extremely expensive, he drops the bombshell. It is illegal to sell or buy the guitar because their production nearly resulted in the extinction of the majestic sea turtles. Had Rick purchased it, he could have been arrested and subjected to tens of thousands of dollars in fines, not to mention being placed under house arrest. This is the guitar I called you about. Wow, the sea turtle maybe? Cool, very cool. What are your concerns? Basically, is it legal to own? And any idea what it's worth? This is kind of a tough one because I don't think you'd get in any trouble owning it because there's a lot of this stuff floating around. It's been around for, you know, ever. People have been making stuff out of tortoise. But I don't know about selling. I would think one that was made really well, you could probably get some money for. And honestly, dude, I wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole. There's people that have 
done 10 months of in-house arrest and paid like 20 grand in fines for selling this stuff illegally. That's what I would be concerned with, you know? <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Right, no problem. Good luck with it, man. Hey, thank you. I'm going to look at my options as to what I can and can't do with it. I've got two girls and I don't want jail visits from them. Secret Service White House credentials. Rick is intrigued when a client brings him some political memorabilia from a former U.S. Attorney General, Howard McGrath. Though Mike wants a mere thousand dollars for the items, Rick isn't certain that one of the items is legal to own. He's not ready to risk purchasing a counterfeit $10 bill that has been signed by the former AG without an expert's opinion. What do we got? I have some political memorabilia, the Secret Service ID for J. Howard McGrath, Attorney General of the United States. Okay. Some letters signed to him by J. Edgar Hoover, Hubert Humphrey, his White House pass. Oh, that's cool. And half of a $10 bill signed to him. These are pretty interesting here. And this right here is? I believe that is half of a counterfeit $10 bill. They signed it to the Attorney General. You sure it's counterfeit and just not a bad misprint? I don't know. Um, yeah, it's counterfeit. I don't even think it's legal to own this thing. You got some neat stuff here. And these three things right here, I really want to get checked out. I'm not 100% positive, but I'm pretty sure it's a felony to own this thing. Let me go make a phone call. I'll be right. right back. Thanks. Scared of committing a felony and ending up in hot water, Rick summons Mark Patton for professional advice. After Mark confirms that the Secret Service credentials are genuine, he advises Rick not to purchase the $10 bill. It is illegal to own, let alone buy or sell. Now let me take a look here. Oh yes, this is his Secret Service credential. The embossing, the seal is right on this, so this is all right. Normally, if you see one, it's been marked, retired, so this is quite unusual. The concerned client wants to shred the bill, but Mark advises him to return it into the Secret Service. Despite the close shave, the seller manages to get $500 for the Secret Service credentials. How collectible is this guy, and is any of this stuff legal to own? Having a White House pass, they are not real common. They are collected. That, on the other hand, you don't want. Counterfeit bill is not legal to own. So obviously, these guys were probably involved in whatever case this came out of and gave it to them as a souvenir. This is the sort of thing that you don't want to own. Can we shred it? No. Best thing to do is turn that in to the, the Secret Service. OK. Thanks for coming in, Mark. Not a problem. You're the best. Appreciate it. All righty. What do you want to do with these? I'd like to sell them. How much you want for them? I'd like $1,000. Not going to happen. How about 800 Four. Yeah, I mean, I, I need to get five. Yeah, I'll give you 500 bucks. Good deal. All right, you want to write them up? Yeah, sure. Come with me, man. Ides of March coin. Rick desperately wants to buy one of the most epic coins he has ever been offered, a legendary Ides of March coin that was minted in 42 BC to mark the assassination of Julius Caesar. The seller wants to sell it for $150,000 and use the money to expand his coin collection. After Rick delivers the obligatory history lesson on the history of the item, he finally calls an expert. I have an ancient Roman coin I'd like to sell. It's from 42 BC. It's two daggers and it says Ides of March. Is Brutus on the other side? Yes. Damn. I'm at the pawn shop because I would like to see if I could sell my Ides of March coin. I think the coin is the holy grail of Roman coins. If I can sell it, I've got my eye on some uh, rare coins that are coming up for auction in about a month. It's just such amazing history. Brutus and then some other guys in the Roman Senate got together and say, hey, when Julius Caesar shows up today, uh, we're all going to walk up and say, hey, dude, what's up? And then we're all going to stab him. <laughs> and was it was like 12 guys or 13 guys that um, stabbed Julius Caesar? At, at least. And he died right there on the Senate floor. I mean, uh, it would be the equivalent today of killing a president in the Capitol building. Let me call a friend of mine and take a look at it. It's, it's a lot of money, and I want his opinion on whether it's real or not. And um, we'll see if we can make a deal. Sounds great. Okay. Rick's expert is so excited to get a chance to view the precious coin. That is quite anticlimactic when he appraises it at $120,000. Despite the seller's disappointment, Rick is quick to offer $100,000 for the ancient history and blood-soaked coin. The seller counters with $140,000, and Rick offers him $110,000 instead. 
the seller digs in his heels at 140,000. Rick is so sad to watch the coin go that he begs the customer to come back if he ever changes his mind. When you told me you had a coin with two daggers and a cap on it, I ran down here. Okay, so the big question, what do you think it's worth? This one has the advantage of having a very large planchet where you can see the whole design. Such a famous coin, and it looks like there are no issues. This is the real deal. Personally, I think a collector would be very happy to pay about $125,000 for the coin. Okay. I agree with Dave. It's an incredible coin. It's like uber, uber cool. And um, I would give you 100000 for it. I could come down maybe to 140. If I give you 110000 I know I will at least break even. I've got to have more than that. 110 is it. Yeah, I don't think I can go below 140. If you change your mind or have really bad luck while you're in town, <laughs> come back and see me. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Civil War Pistol Collection. Rick has to think on his feet when a client offers him an impressive Civil War collection while his arms expert is out of town. Though Corey tries talking him out of gambling on the impressive collection, Rick sides with his gut instincts and goes for the deal. So what do we have here? We have some pistols. There's about 13 of them. Interesting. So where'd you get these? These were my grandfather's grandfathers. So did he rob banks or? <laughs> Definitely got some cool stuff. They all look like 32 Rimfire, so I guess he collected 32 Rimfire. You have a little bit of everything here. Um, can I make a phone call and see if I can get a buddy down here to look at this stuff? Yeah, that'd be great. So how much you want for these things? So I was thinking probably about 500 each. Okay, um, that's a starting point. I mean, you got some neat stuff here. Got a problem. What's that? Can't get a hold of Alex. Okay. Um... The client asks for $6,500 for the guns, but Rick considers that selling price too high to be worth the risk. Eventually, he buys the collection for $4,000. Corey is disappointed when Alex, their weapons expert, confirms that Rick did not mess up. He seems very sullen as Alex congratulates Rick on the almost tenfold profit that he stands to make on the guns. I'll tell you what, because I'm sort of buying a pig and a poke here. I'll give you $3,500 for all of them. That's definitely lower than I was thinking. Could you do like $5,500? Okay, I'll tell you what. Four grand is like the best I could do. Okay, I think that'll work. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, sweet, four grand. I bought a collection of 32 caliber Ren Fire pistols. Oh, there are a ton of them. How much you pay? $4,000 for all of them. For all of them? For all of them, yeah. Here, what you have is a mix of Civil War pistols and cowboy pistols. So 1860s and 1870s. So the Civil War guns tend to start at about $1,000 at the bottom and then move up. So he did a fairly good job, right? 13 original 32 rim fires, $4,000 is a really good job. Without firing any, I would imagine that you'll double your money. If you can fire a few and, and they're really mechanically sound, you may even triple it. Okay. This is where we'll end our video. We hope you enjoyed watching. Make sure to comment, hit that like and subscribe button. Hit that notification bell for more videos like this. Share this video to your family and friends. See you soon.